Good evening, everyone, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to this fireside chat to, of course, talk about the Global Marketing Leadership Programme, a world first from a programme perspective uh, that we have developed in partnership with Berkeley University. My name is David Field, and I'm the Chief Executive of the Marketing Institute Ireland, and I'm delighted to be joined by Frederick and Pat this evening, who I will formally introduce in a couple of minutes, but before I do, I might give some context to the programme. Around 12 months ago, I reached out to around 40 senior marketeers in the industry. What became apparent was that nothing existed from a professional development perspective that talked to the challenges facing senior marketeers when it comes to leadership, organizational change management, data-driven business intelligence, and customer-centric and technology-conscious marketing. In other words, the digital disruption happening all around us. This new program was shaped to deliver those challenges and uh, to deliver on those challenges and bridge that gap. And not only that, it is accredited by one of the biggest and most reputable universities in the US. This program is about helping senior marketeers step into a leadership role in their organization. And for me, there are three aspects that this program will support you on. It will support you on your personal journey and how you gain new skills from an individual perspective and the tools to become a future leader. It will support you on your team journey, equipping you with the systems you need that will allow you lead your team as you navigate the digital disruption in front of us all. And it will support you on your organizational leadership journey in terms of how you can affect change at a corporate level. And this program, I believe, will benefit the profession of marketing, not just in Ireland, but further afield. I'm delighted to be joined this evening by Frederick Quirrell. Frederick is the Associate Dean of Corporate Affairs at Berkeley Global, and Frederick has been instrumental in the development of this program. Frederick is a researcher specializing in innate human behavior and an expert in academic innovation and design. At Berkeley, he is developing fully integrated transdisciplinary study programs that allows students and lifelong learners to acquire the specific skills, they, uh, skill sets they need to succeed in their careers in the upcoming fourth industrial revolution. With his team, he brings together world leading researchers from Berkeley and industry experts from Silicon Valley who work and teach at the forefront of academic innovation. Frederick today in a few minutes will outline the essential core competencies that will empower marketing professionals to lead tra digital transformation in their organizations. And will also talk to the Berkeley unique learning approach, the most advanced intensive learning approach to date based on leading neuroscientific education research. As well as being joined by Frederick, I'm delighted to say we are joined by Pat Reed, And I genuinely mean uh, I'm delighted to say that because she, Pat will be the lead instructor on the people vertical of this program around leadership and change management. I've had a few conversations with Pat over the last couple of weeks, and I've been blown away by the questions she poses and the tools that, tools that she has talked, to me to, talked me through that can help take, your leadership, take you to that leadership role. Pat's experience speaks for itself. Pat leads large scale agile transformations in corporations and government agencies worldwide and is currently working with the Australian and New Zealand governments on agile transformation. She has proven success transforming large organizations and developing world class enterprise agile practices, most recently with Walmart and their 2 million employees. Pat has worked as, a, as an executive director at the Walt Disney Group, Universal Studios. Pat was a chief information officer at Gameworks, an executive director at Gap and has worked with so many world-renowned companies such as NBC, eBay, Walmart, Sega, General Electric, to name but a few. Pat's unique skills include transformational leadership, connecting strategy to delivery, and solving impossible cha business challenges by leveraging deep domain knowledge and human behavior, human behavior, patterns and design thinking, and empirical scientific methods with a razor-like focus on value. So I think we're an extremely good company this evening, and I would absolutely urge you all to put your questions in the chat for either Frederic and of course, Pat, if you have any questions, because we wanna make this session as interactive as possible. So maybe at this point, what I'll do is I'll hand over to Frederic, and maybe you might say a few words, Frederic, about the, the program itself and, and the learning approach in Berkeley. Thank you so much, David. Um, first off, I can say it's an absolute delight uh, to be here tonight um, because I feel amongst colleagues, I am actually a marketer myself by, um, by study and um, at heart as well. So being able to collaborate with you, David, and your team has been absolutely marvelous. 
um, and very exciting and mentally stimulating because we as an academic institution here at Berkeley, we're not just leading research, we're also leading academic uh, innovation and design. And we are looking to find experts around the globe um, that can complement us, that can help us and work with us on this journey to providing meaningful education to professionals at the very highest level. And you are one of our prime partners in this, and we are very happy to be able to work with you, learn with you, and provide these incredible learning experiences um, to C-level um, marketers, I would say, first off, but probably the people um, participating and learning about this program, there's many more than marketers that will be interested in joining. The challenge that we are facing collectively, not as an institution or an association, but collectively as a global society through digital transformation is truly remarkable. And what we found really through the last year, as some uh, Silicon Valley business leaders said, is we have leaped forward probably 10 years in, in our development. Many, many things were in the making and 2020 was a true catalyst for many technologies um, to push automation to the limits and to the maximum. And while these effects uh, have begun rippling, many institutions and organizations are not yet fully clear uh, of what impact this will have. So we have really um, put our heads together, put our respective research together with MII and Berkeley to um, develop this program along those key uh, functions and key base uh, knowledge bases that are really essential for leaders going forward. And particularly with the recognition that so much is now coming out of consumer centric marketing and technology. We have a strong base where we need to educate leaders and marketers around the business competencies, the ability to understand how data is driving business and how we can use data to drive businesses. Once we understand data, the key critical aspects of understanding how we can use data to be more consumer centric, understand consumers and the way they use technology will be absolutely essential to drive our companies forward. And to make that happen, we all know by now that um, no one is an island in an organization and having a few agile teams or a few consumer centric teams in a company will not make them change and will not fully transform the organization. So the key aspect of it is how from this knowledge and this understanding of who we actually serve as an organization, the consumer, how can we drive from that aspect, the organizational change as a marketer, as a leader in an organization is really critical um, for the success of digital transformation and has become urgent since the massive leap that most organizations have taken last year. Our education program that we have um, applied here, or education structure that David alluded to, is really specifically designed for people at the very highest level. Um, you don't have time to learn much. You're not looking to do exercises. You're not looking to, to learn in the traditional sense. You're looking to understand. And this is what these types of programs provide it's um, experiential learning through company visits, virtual and real, linked to conceptual learning, where you have highest level experts and faculty explaining concepts and the leading trends, combined with social learning, where you have the opportunity to discuss and have the content make sense and provide meaning. And finally, combining that with applied learning, where you can come with your own problems into a, this type of program, your own challenges, and develop answers together with a combination of experts from Silicon Valley and around the world. So we are extremely excited to be able to open um, this panel event um, as a first part of uh, the program. And we are extremely excited to start off our collaboration uh, and launch this with you, David, and your team. Thank you so much, and we're very much looking forward to this. 
Great, Frederick, and thank you. I think you uh, uh, explained very clearly. And one of the questions already popped in was actually about the kind of the learning experience and, and assignments. And I think you answered that perfectly in relation to the fact that this is very much an experiential uh, program. So thank you for that. Um, and look, uh, uh, by all means, if anybody has any questions for Frederick, we can certainly pose them to Frederick uh, uh, maybe at the end of the session. Um, Look, uh, without further ado, I might um, uh, reintroduce Pat and say I'm delighted that you're here this evening, Pat. And I think we're going to try and keep this as interactive as possible, Pat. Uh, and and I'm, I'm hoping that we'll have lots of questions coming in from, um, from the people who are listening and watching. And uh, because you're going to talk about change uh, is the new normal and really how you design an agile organization. And I think that will spill into a lot of conversations at a personal level professional level and business level as well. So, uh, so look, I'm really looking forward to this, Pat. So I'll hand over to you and, uh, and we'll take it from there. Thank you so much and delighted to be here. Um, I um, will do my best to make this extremely practical tonight and to keep it short so that we do enable ourselves to, uh, to have as much time as possible. And thank you for that great introduction, David. So, Jumping right in, we all experience living in a VUCA world, that volatility, that uncertainty, that complexity, and probably one of the biggest challenges, the ambiguity that we're all facing today. So we're going to address some of the things that we can learn to do today, starting today, you know, when we leave this program, to prepare ourselves to not only thrive in an environment that is riddled with VUCA, but actually to create an opportunity to create our future uh, starting again today. So the key to think about is how do we transform volatility? And what is the outcome that we're seeking? We're seeking awareness and we're transforming it into learning. Learning as an adaptable action is the key to thriving in that VUCA, in that, uh, in that experience of the future. Staying connected to purpose. One of the most important skills we have as leaders is to provide that level of clarity in a field of volatility to our teams by giving them a clear connection to your purpose and the outcomes that you're seeking, and then becoming adaptive uh, as we talked about already, change is the new normal. So we have to be change. We have to be adapting to that change and welcome it, kind of change our relationship sort of so that we, we step into the change rather than hold back because of fear of the unknown or not really knowing what to do. We won't know what to do, but uh, we'll know that we'll learn by doing it. So the second of you in VUCA is transforming uncertainty. That often holds us back because we'll be placed in situations where we've never been placed before. We're stepping into the unknown future. And what do we do when we don't know what to do? Step into that unknown and embrace it wholeheartedly, knowing again that we don't know what we're going to do until we experience it and start to build our learning agility, which is our ability to learn experientially from the challenge uh, that we're encountering at the moment, transforming real time, that uncertainty into new knowledge that we can use right away and generative knowledge that we can store so that we will know how to use it in the future through practice. Sense-making is a skill that we would do well to think about. All of us have gotten to where we are in our careers by building our planning and predictability skills. Some of us may hold on to those and really, oh, really find them comforting. Uh, they are comforting. Your planning and, and predicting skills are always going to be important. But the window and time and speed is going to accelerate radically as you adapt continuously to new horizons of change that are emerging around us real time. And in that regard, I would recommend that as uh, you're listening to our talk tonight, you start to jot down some notes in the form of your own personal playbook. 
And one of the things I would suggest you add to your playbook is building my sense-making skills. Sense-making to augment that planning and predicting creates an amazing GPS for you to navigate your future, whatever that might hold, five years, 10 years, forever. Um, understanding simplicity as well. When we're dealing with complexity, the, the only antidote to complexity is simple rules and finding the patterns of simplicity to focus on first principles to follow up with those rules. And start to think instead of uh, long-term plans and, and long-term strategies, shortening that time window to, to adapt those strategies and put in the feedback loops for learning so that you will know if your strategy is being effective or if you need to tune it more regularly. Frequent tune-ups will be key. So the last thing in transforming uncertainty, it's going to be important for us to validate our assumptions far more than we have in the past because of the speed of change and change being that new normal. It's happening faster and faster. It's accelerating. We need to um, shorten our windows of learning through our assumptions and let go of assumptions when they no longer serve us. Many of us find that's hard. One of the hardest things to do is let go of our previous, uh, what worked for us in the past and embrace what's going to work for us by paying attention to the terrain and what's ahead of us, letting go quickly to create the space to learn. You'll hear throughout the night that learning is the key and learning requires energy and it, it requires us to let go of anything that we don't need so that we create ample space for learning and generative learning there. Uh, and we learn how to experiment to validate our assumptions, transforming assumptions into evidence. Imagine if we could all even change some of the way we fund our projects to be evidence-based funding rather than wishful thinking-based funding. Transforming complexity into knowledge through systems and experimental thinking, generating knowledge and wisdom from that uncertainty is what a leader of the future really focuses on. And we learn more by taking action and doing than researching. Uh, we learn more by reading the terrain and understanding what's going on out there, getting out of the office and being in the change we actually, the antidote to uh, all the radical change that we're dealing with is becoming the change, embracing it, welcoming it uh, as an adventure and kind of stepping into that change. So the last uh, part of VUCA is transforming ambiguity for your teams into clarity. This is probably one of the most important skills that you need to build, that we need to build as adaptive leaders. Our teams are looking for us to cut through the noise and cut through the confusion, transforming that uncertainty uh, and ambiguity into clarity. Ambiguity frightens teams. It, it kind of holds them back. But if you could provide that clarity and focus, the teams feel confident of knowing what success looks like, and they will step into the, the role co-creating it with you in terms of making their own priorities and knowing what's important and how they need to prioritize their time. It enables us to expose the hidden forces that actually hold us back through fear. And you're enabling the teams to make the invisible visible. These are some of the most powerful tools and they're on a more technical scale that leaders can embrace. We talk a lot about value, but how many of us actually understand how to measure and quantify and prioritize and fund based on value scores and value indexes, you know, tempered by the risk and um, making very wise decisions so that we can free up the capacity to learn from the future as it emerges. That's the key. There's a capacity issue here. If we're so busy being busy, because we don't let go of what we need to let go and free up the capacity to learn new things as we need to, 
we're not going to be as effective as we need to be to create that amazing future for ourselves and our teams and our organizations and be able to quantify and to use empirical data to make value-based decisions on what to do and most importantly, what not to do. Letting go of anything that doesn't create measurable and um, effective value. Uh, also, clarity helps us to nurture our intuition and thereby in being a role model for our teams to nurture their intuition as well. The intuition here is important to augment that planning and predicting and logical part of your brain, pulling in that right side of your brain to kind of whole brain leadership here, respecting that and putting some energy into that sense-making and into that intuitive building helps us to look at our options when we start to embrace that uh, and challenge our assumptions as well as our options by practicing future back thinking. I'm gonna share some practical examples of how I do that with the leaders that I work with around the world and myself by starting with real clarity of what success looks like, taking a quick trip to the future frequently and understanding what we're going to be facing so we can make that informed roadmap and action plan based on having already spent time in the near future. Reframing and shifting our own thinking as leaders, our actions carry so much more weight than our words. Our teams are watching us. And if we're not in control of our own limbic systems and frequently find ourselves stressing out and not following through to what we know we need to adapt to as adaptive leaders, an example of that would be if we find ourselves telling teams what to do because it's worked for us in the past, as opposed to asking questions and telling them why and what success looks like, which are the new skills that will really create an amazing future for not only ourselves, but our teams. Focusing okay. on what really matters. So with Pat, oh, yes, please, David. Sorry, sorry, Pat. I was just going to say, just to build on what you're saying there. So, so what do we need to start doing to effectively build our skills for the future? You know, what, what, what are the things that need to be done? Or what ah, brilliant. Be brilliant. Uh, get right to that practical part. Well done, David. And that is, I personally spend time in the future, in my mind, creating a, a simulation, let's call it, simulation labs of the future. And you invite your teams to pick a date in the future that they want to focus on. And we start to think, what is life going to be like at that time in the future? We envision, we imagine, we, we use our creativity. Notice, David, how that pulls in both right and left brain thinking yeah. and the power of the whole team working on that. So I'll give that a name, David. Take a quick trip to the future. Uh, and we and teams love it. You know, they'll say, ah, we're going to the future today. And then you can pick a date, you know, three months from now, three years from now. Uh, you don't want to go too far into the future because things are going to change radically. But when you start to experience that, and teams actually do it themselves, the most powerful application of that is by imagining the future of your project that you're working on now and what's going to shift so you can focus on the highest value work. Does that make sense? Absolutely, yeah. So Great. And another thing you can start to do. Oh, my pleasure. And great question. Another thing you can do is start to pay attention to the professional futurists out there. I carve out at least five hours a week paying attention to what the futurists are saying. And there's some really good futurists to start paying attention to and almost envision your own self as having so, as a leader of, of needing to develop your future strengths. Uh, those are all great ways to not only focus on what really matters, but let go of what helped you back and to create your edge. And let's call it a future edge, David, kind of create that future edge for yourselves. So at the heart, if there's one takeaway from tonight's talk, mindset is everything. And that is... Um, that is golden, right? We are doomed to failure without a daily deconstruction of our mindset. 
And I'm going to tell a quick story before I'll get into some details on how. Um, most transformations fail. I'm wondering if it, all of the our audience knows that almost all transformations fail to deliver their planned benefits. The Peter Drucker Institute out of Vienna did a study a couple of years ago to find out why, because they were so concerned about the failure rate worldwide. And they found that the number one indicator of a successful transformation was the leader's mindset. In fact, they were so powerfully impressed by what their findings were, having done real uh, on-site research of those transformations that succeed, distilling that as the single pattern that they published some great work and created a learning consortium. And all of our listeners can find that data online and I'm sure we'll be able to provide them that at the end as well. So mindset is everything. If one takeaway from tonight, that's it. And that's the beauty of it. It's in our complete control. In my next slide, I'm going to go a little bit deep but very quickly, we won't go over this, but I thought in the practicality spirit, I would share with the uh, teams my adaptive leadership mindset and playbook. And part of the beauty of the mindset is believing. And I'm gonna tell another quick story. We've all grown up under the, probably hearing the belief that I'll believe it when I see it. An invitation I want to uh, give everyone is to flip that and question what we need to believe first to see it. Beliefs are everything. And that is why the mindset is so important. If we believe we can achieve something, we will achieve it. If we believe we won't, we won't. It's as powerful and simple as that. So kind of challenge yourself daily. Uh, instead of that cynical voice that might pop up, uh, you want to transform that cynical voice of, yeah, I'll believe it when I see it, to I'm going to uh, believe it first so that I can see it. And the patterns and the tools here for believing and seeing is that growth mindset. The growth mindset enables you to step into a challenge, believing you're going to learn from it, and that you will solve it uh, because of your confidence in the power of your learning mindset. So we kind of, I like to transform the concept of growth mindset into a learning mindset. And then adaptability starts with sharpening our observation, interpretation, and intervention skills. And these are all some techniques that you can use. Um, but to remember for ourselves that our Adaptability is developed through the challenges that we face. We welcome challenge because we know the greater the challenge, the greater our adaptability. And then principles, leading first principles are very helpful and reinforced through context specific practices. Any questions on this um, uh, recognizing too that we sometimes have those biases that hold us back. Any check-in uh, from the audience or that you'd like I, to? I have, a, I have a question here from Kathy, which uh, uh, just speaks to an earlier point. When you're, you know, when teams are feeling overwhelmed with change today, any thoughts on how we balance the, I suppose, the simplify today with the what could be tomorrow? So in other words, that, that future edge versus, yes. the, versus the madness of the day, the, the day today, I guess. Yes, um, but also to respond to that, is welcome that team's feedback and engage them in co-creating ideas of what they need, right? And understanding that we as leaders uh, address their needs to provide them that clarity. So some of the tools that I'd also recommend we just jot down maybe right now in our playbook, clarity of purpose, clarity of outcome, the greatest gift we can give our teams is our clarity of the vision of why and help them understand why so they can actually anchor it and then use that to create their line of sight and understand that why. That deep understanding uh, cuts right through that whole uncertainty and ambiguity and all the forces that are there. We as leaders kind of provide that clarity. Um, does that make sense, David? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Cool. And this slide goes into a little more detail. The, the heart of an adaptive organization, 
the heart of a successful agile transformation, the heart of creating an amazing future are our teams. So we as leaders need to provide the psychological safety for them to learn. A quick note here, psychological safety is critical. If teams are fearful, if they're afraid, if they're overwhelmed by that uncertainty, their energy is not fully anchored in learning. It's uh, anchored in trying to relieve themselves of the fear that's out there. So we as leaders want to create fearless teams and create psychological safety and the capacity to learn. So there was a capacity element to your last question too, David, um, because um, there's some deep, great psychological studies here. Google in particular discovered this the hard way because they hired the best and the brightest, um, but they weren't getting the results they needed because they weren't providing the psychological safety that the teams needed because they were all competing with each other. Some uh, antiquated leadership skills were uh, competitive, uh, creating that competitive spirit as opposed to we all win together. So that's another adage we can put into our playbooks. We all win together. When one of us wins, we all win as a team, as an organization. Uh, when one of us loses, we all lose. So we start to expand our network effect, recognizing we need help from everyone and we all win together. So in times of drastic change, it's the learners who to create the future. In fact, they find themselves equipped to deal in a world that no longer exists. So other uh, elements getting right down to the practical elements, what can we as teams what are the outcomes that, as leaders, what are the outcomes that we're looking for to achieve? We need to build our flexibility and we can try willingness to try new things. In fact, pushing ourselves into trying new things frequently. The more frequent we do it, the more change ready and future ready we're going to be. Speed, what's the simplest way to get things done would be a question we might add to our repertoire of leadership questions. What's the fastest way to do it? We will have a tendency to over-engineer solutions. That's a habit from the 20, 30, 40 years ago. We now need to thin slice it. What's the simplest way we can validate our assumptions, test our ideas, and create that evidence that we need to move forward quickly and rapidly into the future. Experimenting, testing out those new ideas we need to all go back to our science class and put on our, our uh, imagineering hats to experiment continuously, push ourselves into performance risk-taking and even interpersonal risk-taking in terms of possibly some sports, you know, or possibly some new uh, books to read. Uh, stretching again our comfort zones to be much more future ready, collaborating, leveraging the skills of others and helping each other's out, looking for opportunities to collaborate. Information gathering, uh, Frederick mentioned this a lot about our empirical data and learning from real data. So we won't be able to learn from real data if we don't gather unbiased information to challenge our mental models or cognitive biases, which are going to get in our way. So learning through empirical data is our friend to combat our cognitive biases. Reflecting so often as leaders, we're too busy to think and we're too busy to really carve out some time each week in a retrospective to really reflect on what, what did we learn and take every learning into an actionable, adaptive action. What are we going to do about it? Because if we don't, if we carve out the time to reflect, but we don't take the time to transform that into generative learning that becomes part of our playbook and our repertoire for future unknown challenges, then we've lost an opportunity. And trusting and enabling the teams. Lastly, um, trust first is a good adage for us to remember. Trust first, but verify with empirical data and provide the clarity that the teams need so that you can safely trust them. Capability. Do, you me, do you mind me asking? Oh, yes. sorry, sorry, sorry to cut across oh, here. No, Just, uh, uh, obviously, the, the, the 
program is really going to uh, unpick the kind of the tools and ways of of, of under of navigating those uh, the, those ten things you've just talked to. Um, I have a question here from Lucy. Um, she said, "Thank you." Uh, oh, sorry. Um, not all change is beneficial to employees, especially during restructures and times of change. How do you suggest achieving this in 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 this scenario? Brilliant. Um, and Lucy's absolutely right. Absolute transparency is critical, but engaging the team in the knowledge of why, why it's important. So you're sharing with the teams the greater good so they can kind of wrap their head around that, right? What teams need to know. And what Lucy, we can do is we can take a look at what do our teams need? Teams need autonomy, mastery, and purpose. So you can give them that purpose by explaining to them the why, why this is happening so they get their heads wrapped around it, they can start to embrace it. They might be able to see a future possibility where it will be good. In fact, you might invite them to co-create, how can we make this work for the greater good of the team? You know, and challenge them to embrace that as their adaptive challenge. But authenticity, Lucy, spot on there, that authenticity, transparency, and honesty having the courage to be an authentic leader um, and to speak the truth is really important. Um, sometimes uh, people, we, we, re we don't recognize, adaptive leaders recognize the importance of tension as well. So tension is an enabler. In fact, tension is one of the most disruptive enablers of breakthrough innovation. So in their old worldview, they might not see the change as good, but if we can help them step out of that old world view with some future trips to the future and imagining, imagineering how this might create a better future, they can let go of some of those past mental models and explore some potential uh, that will help them move forward quicker. I hope that helps. Okay, great, thank you. Any other questions? Before we jump into this, this is pretty self-explanatory as well, the list on the screen ahead of us. Um, and you're absolutely right, David. These are the skills that we as leaders want to cultivate in ourselves first, and then that we want to nurture and to create an environment of learning so that our teams, uh, we're actually cultivating this into our teams, starting with the mindset, then sense-making, learning agility is that very important skill. And here in the United States, most executives are recruited for their learning agility in big corporations because they're recruiting leaders who can learn real time from the changes that's happening and not who have uh, entrenched thinking of what worked for them throughout their stellar careers. Uh, that is learning agility can be defined as, as generative learning or experiencing something with a learner's mindset so that we can distill what's worth learning from this and what's what we need to let go of that will interrupt our ability to fully learn this. So learning agility is a very powerful school uh, tool and there's a lot of good books on learning agility um, and how to cultivate that in yourselves and in your teams. Adaptive leadership is one of my favorites. Um, I do workshops on adaptive leadership several times a week to executives all over the world. And that is to diagnose the challenges that are ahead of us and use this experimental thinking to validate our assumptions and to make it so automatic that it becomes part of our repertoire after it becomes part of our playbook. Not to overlook creativity to enable us to use both sides of the brain and innovation. Um, disrupting uh, old ways of working, one of the tools I use, a powerful tool called OODA loops. It stands for observe, orient, decide, and act quickly to really accelerate our ability to make split second decisions based on empirical data that will serve us into the future. Remember I mentioned speed is going to be absolutely vital. So the faster we can make sound decisions, the better our skills are going to be for navigating that unknown future. Complexity thinking and problem solving 
all of us have built phenomenal problem solving skills, but sometimes when we develop or rely on our, our base problem solving skills, we forget that there are different levels of problem solving that we need to do when a problem is complex. So we diagnose quickly, are we dealing with a simple problem or a complicated problem or a complex problem? And that skill set is extremely important to master because if we've ever struggled with problem solving and found that uh, there, it just seems the problem seems to keep coming back, um, it's, it would serve us well to spend a, a, some time learning how to diagnose the problem. Um, managing polarities and dilemmas is a separate problem solving, value engineering, empathy, speed, and presencing, being present as authentic leaders. Thank you very much. Great. Um, I have a question here actually just uh, has come in from Sonia. Have you used a, I think it's a Sinefin model? Is it a C? Oh yes, a Sinefin model. Kinefin model is uh, David Snowden's model. It is a brilliant model for navigating that diagnostic of what kind of problem do I want to solve? In fact, it is placeholder number one in this element in my playbook. And I use it all the time. So well done for her to call that out. The Kinevin model. It's um, Welsh. Uh -huh. uh, a few questions. Like, you know, you, you've obviously worked with organizations all over the world. Um, why do organizations fail at, uh, uh, at, the, at this transformation? What, like, could, could you... I suppose yeah. if you could write, write a book and that you'd be, you'd be a millionaire, but what, what are the kind of the key things that why businesses fail? The most important thing and the most prevalent thing is leaders often default to process. Our brains crave certainty. And sometimes we fall into the trap of saying, well, we'll need to put a process together. We'll need to put a checklist together. We'll need to put a playbook together. We need to do process maps, process, process, process. Process is one of those things, ultralight, that we need to shift as leaders to focus on what's the most ultralight process that serves us and how do we need to let go of the heavy process that might have served us 20, 40 years ago but are now holding us back. So I would say the number one symptom would be overdependence on unnecessary or non-value added processes. So sprinkle through my talk, focusing on value. If a process is creating measurable value and the value is worth more than the effort to administer the process, then by all means, keep it but make it ultra light and invite the teams to say, is there a simpler way to do this? Okay. Well, Pat, you've talked a lot about learning culture actually, and, uh, and you've mentioned that, um, you know, how important is learning culture in or, uh, uh, to organizations and committing to it and investing in it? You know, it, like when you think about the few, those future skills. I think it's, uh, it's an imperative. I think organizations who don't recognize and invest in the team's capacity to learn the um, trap a lot of organizations fall into is thinking the more the better or we need to be busy. Busy, busy, busy is a good thing. But if we don't carve out time to learn, then we're actually moving backwards and we'll find out too late that we haven't cultivated the team's learning agility because of the speed of change. Going all the way back to tonight's theme, David, uh, change being the new norm, the greater the speed of change, the more important the speed of learning. In fact, a good thing to remember is we need to learn faster than the change that's going to trip us up, you know, or disrupt our market. We need to be ahead of the change curve. Um, and we need to step into that as an adventure and welcome it, right? We need to say, cool, let's step into that. But um, we need to welcome change. We need to be the change. We need to actually become the change agents as leaders. And uh, one mention I'd also have, sorry, I didn't mention this earlier, David, is co-creation is key. Sometimes the second thing beyond process is we think we as leaders have all the answers. It could be subliminal, 
But sometimes we think as leaders, we need to drive this. The real spirit of transformational change success is in co-creation, getting every one of the organization's uh, people involved and feeling as if they own part of the change. And there's lots of ways we can talk about in our Q&A on how we might do that. When everybody's driving change, nobody's resisting it because they say, I'm leading this change. And how do you get that? So, so when you've got people who, you know yourself, people welcome change, people don't welcome change, you know, and some people see it as a challenge or a threat or whatever. So, so how do you get that co-creation going? And what, you know, what, like, again, I'm sure through the program, you, 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 you look at tools and ways yeah. and systems of doing it, but, but at a top line level, how do you get that mindset shifted into a co-creative environment? Great question. And it's situationally specific based on the culture of the organization some being more difficult than others, if the, if the teams are very comfortable having the leaders tell them what to do, you have to flip that first. And the leaders need to tell the teams that they can't do this without them. Uh, so they need to reframe that and they need to reprogram that so that the teams understand they create the value to drive the change. And then we need to follow up with opportunities for change. And I like to uh, create change expos or change events or design the future events, or let's all take a trip to the future uh, in the organization. So you set the tone and you set the stage, but the tone from the top is imperative. We need you, we can't do this without you. We need to all do this together and then create opportunities for team members to volunteer. But at the heart of this, we have to create the capacity for team members to volunteer to lead one of the frames or one of the channels of change. But if we're expecting them to be working 100% of their capacity, uh, we have to first reserve whatever percentage of their capacity, the, the individual team members number of hours they normally work a week, we need to actually carve out and prioritize change as an imperative, and then showcase it, spotlight it, give give people an opportunity to lead a change channel, you know, or a change uh, project, or a change initiative, uh, and then uh, showcase it and celebrate it. Celebration is underserved as well. Oftentimes we don't we're busy being busy, but we don't recognize the power of what people need is that autonomy, mastery, and purpose again, they need to really feel they're mastering something and it's being celebrated um, to, to help um, drive those future skills that we need to be ready for change, uh, to be ahead of change, to actually embrace the change and welcome it. Okay, fantastic. Uh, question here from Tara. Hi, Pat, love the premise of believing and you will solve and taking a trip to the future. What balance do you believe we need to have in agile planning versus the traditional annual business planning, i.e. how often should we as leaders be encouraging our teams to step into the future? The yes, program. brilliant. Well, at the beginning, it's important to set the tone, you know, and to really set that future focus. So by stepping into the future at the very beginning of a project and envisioning what success looks like with absolute clarity, is, uh, and sometimes only takes, um, I would say four or five hours to run through that future game to practice it. But then frequently when we're stuck in a dilemma uh, or maybe kind of we need a, a booster, maybe um, monthly, maybe bi-weekly uh, might be important to really get that clarity of what do we need to do differently and reflect on how is this working because when we go to Agile from a traditional way of working, we're, we're, we're kind of changing everyone's old patterns of work. And it starts by that new way of thinking with the mindset. And then we need a new way of practice by doing and then learn from that. Is it serving us? Are we doing it right? Do we need to tune it up? How can we do it better? Uh, so getting back to the question, uh, it really depends on the situation and the culture, but the importance of getting the team's feedback uh, and doing health checks with the teams 
that will trigger when we need one of these learning interventions. I also would run frequently leading the uh, Agile Transformation at eBay, we ran uh, Lunch and Learns uh, Learning Labs. We call them Learning Labs and Learning Studios at Lunch for anyone who wanted to um, help come and master a skill that was holding them back. So we also ran team health checks, which would tell us whether a team might be struggling and not know what they're struggling with, that would enable you to do a bit of an intervention to help the team unpack what might be holding them back. Using empirical data, again, as your uh, validator to say if the team's not getting better, uh, in an agile world, if the team is not uh, thriving and getting better and better, it's probably getting stuck because of some of that old process. And you might need to come in and sort of cut loose of those old processes. Because the thing about agile, just like everything else, is it needs to be agile, it needs to adapt. It can't just be substitute agile for waterfall and then leave, codify it and then expect it to be agile. Being agile is actually evolving continuously in finding better ways to create value for the customer with a razor-like focus on what the customer really needs and letting go of everything else. There's an element here, David, um, that I'd share with the group as well. Most of us do too much of what doesn't add value. Um, using the Pareto principle, it, challenge ourselves. How much of what we're doing is really creating the value or just busy being busy? And sometimes it's like an 80, 20 percentage of busy versus value. Absolutely. I have a question here from Alo Wally. I hope I've got that right. Uh, apologies if not. Co-creation and collaboration. Which comes oh, first? Yes. Um, well, co-creation, think of co-creation as a spirit. Kind of think of it as a principle. We value co-creation, meaning we know we, we all win together and we need each other. That's the elemental thinking. And then collaboration is how we do it. We collaborate with each other. It's the why and the how, I would say, but they go together like, a, you know, like um, they go together like two sides of a kind of an important coin. Okay, very good. Um, but, but I get the sense that, I suppose, through the program, there's going to be a lot of, uh, I suppose, unpicking of, uh, of the ways of do, uh, the traditional ways of doing things and actually bringing, to your point, the agile look at lens, uh, putting everything through an agile lens and kind of uh, uh, creating new ways of, of, of working or new ways of bringing things to the business, to your team, et cetera, et cetera. Is that a fair reflection of the kind of the, the insight that people are going to get and the learnings uh, that, the, that people are going to get on the program? Yes, exactly. And at the heart of that, David, is learning how to learn because learning is so critical and learning how to let go. But practice. Um, I didn't dwell on it in the talk, but we don't really learn in a, a traditional classroom without some practice, some lab work, some studio work, some you know, experimental work. Uh, learning today requires active learning um, and action-based learning. Right, and I think Frederick talks to that as well at the, at the start about it being very much an experiential learning. Um, I'm not sure if anybody else has any questions, but uh, so I have a scattering of things that, uh, that I know people had asked me um, in advance of this. And I think we've kind of covered quite a few of them. Um, the types of tools that uh, I suppose you, uh, with the experience that you've had, obviously working with the likes of Walmart or even, even more recently with governments, like, you know, Geez, our experience of government certainly here would be that it is very traditional in its way. And, you know, how do you how, how do you approach, I suppose, uh, for want of a better word, a, a, a mindset that that feels that it's never changed? The um, shock therapy is a technique I like to use uh, in reference to government. And I mean that with the greatest respect, using empirical data to highlight the fact that it might not be working as well as it needs to work. And then showcasing against some case studies of what success looks like. If bureaucracy gets um, doing the same thing over and over again when it's not serving you is um, actually going to hold them back. So that shock therapy effect of knowing what success looks like and then getting the most senior leaders involved so they can start to co-create a new culture. 
we haven't mentioned it yet, but your question led to it beautifully, David, and that is you want to create that culture of learning. It's embedded in the very culture. It's who we are. And when I work with agencies, I reframe it's who we are. We are the learners. You know, it's who we are. And, and you anchor it based on their their vision and their purpose. I found that um, that uh, organizations are very respectful of their core purpose. It's who they are to serve uh, the the citizens. Uh, it's who they are, and we need to learn to improve who we are. If that helps, as a cultural level. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, just a, a question in here in relation to recapping on what is required for applying to the program payment options available when is a closing date will there be any more taster sessions similar to this one um my god i'm you're, you're very much putting me on the spot now um so in relation to applying for a program if you can send uh jenny bishop jenny at mii.ie an application which is really i suppose talking to your experience uh in the industry because what we're very much looking to do is uh, is pitch this that are, uh, you know so there's real strong peer-to-peer -peer learning um, there's a lot more information. Um, I think something's just been posted in the chat, which gives you all the detail that you need um, and the payment options available. Um, the closing date is um, the 4th of October. So any expressions of interest we'll need to get, uh, obviously, over the next uh, few weeks because there's limited space available. And we do plan on running another couple of taster sessions on this, um, one in September, I think, and one in November. But again, Jenny will be able to, um, to give you that detail um, but, uh, but it's all available on, in the chat at the moment or reach out to myself or Jenny after and uh, we'll, we'll clarify any of that for you. Um, I'm not sure if anybody else has any more questions for you, Pat. I think you've kind of given a real kind of, uh, I suppose, taster of, of, I suppose, the challenges that are facing organisations. Frederick, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, but the, the, the challenges that are facing organisations and I suppose what this programme will bring. And, and Frederick, maybe I'll leave the last word to you in relation to what... Um, potential participants can expect from this program because we've only uh, I suppose of course today we've just talked about the the leadership pillar and and that kind of uh, uh, that that journey that Pat will lead but um but maybe if you want to kind of close out with some thoughts on the overall program what and what um, participants can expect yeah thank you very much first of all thank you for for this wonderful panel um thank you Pat as well for for your presentation it's always absolutely a, a pleasure listening to you um the, the key thing, and maybe that's in response to one of the questions that I just answered um, uh, by typing in uh, a few thoughts, um, like the work commitment and, and how does the learning really work? And, you know, to be honest, this is one of our biggest challenges with this type of a disruptive program is that whatever you've heard and learned about higher education, about executive education, you can basically... Um, forget because this thing has nothing to do with the traditional uh, program or study or study experience that you can remember from your own college time or university experience. Um, this is really specifically targeted and designed for um, and with industry experts so that you can actually maximize the learning in a way that you can then also apply in your own organizations. So to the point Pat was making, this is really something for people that understand and really want to tackle those challenges that we are facing and that you're facing with the organizations. And a big part of it is this culture of learning. And it's not learning, sitting down, doing assignments and learning by heart. It is literally just being open to understanding deeper and better what is going on so that you can apply that in, to your own organizations and uh, continue creating opportunities for yourself because it's not about following really in digital transformation it's about leading and that is the, the the major difference also what you see in this program so it's not about sitting down and doing assignments after lecture as you remember from university it's actually about reading a few key articles maybe a few pieces that are currently um, offered by thought leaders in the industry opening your mind through these discussions that we're having with the, our lead faculty here, and then going in an informed way through your experience and through pre-readings into a lecture to discuss and to deeper understand, and then taking that to your own project and learn how that could apply to you specifically. 
then take that into a company visit where you have an expert that will just exemplify. This is what you kind of conceptually learn. This is how it looks in reality. And this is how I make sense out of it as an expert. And then given the opportunity or being given the opportunity to discuss it, to share your experience, what you got away from it in a panel discussion, in a networking event, the social learning aspect of it. So effectively, it is an, a learning experience through which you learn. It is not an academic experience where you're going to have a classroom experience, anything like you have ever experienced. And I think that's what's truly unique about this program, Frederick, isn't it? Is, is that exactly what you've just said here. You're, you're, you're understanding more so than, uh, you know, uh, learning necessarily. And you're that peer to peer engagement and that access to, I suppose, leading experts in, in, in Silicon Valley that have, 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 can show and demonstrate your challenges are things that we've actually delivered on and not just delivered on, but led on. And I think that's the, 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 the beauty of the, 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 the program from end to end. That'd be a fair point. Absolutely. And I would literally just invite everybody to reach out, ask questions um, and discuss with us because this is a, a program, again, made for you um, by experts. So it's a collaboration. It's really something where as the participant, you are part of this uh, experience and it is a unique opportunity to get together with other leading experts in the field and then to join into sessions with thought leaders and experts <clears throat> that are currently creating the ripples that are impacting your organization today and more so will do that in the future. I can tell you like things as a marketer myself, <laughs> Things that you hear are currently happening in some of these uh, startups or uh, disruptive uh, companies that we have here in Silicon Valley are, are truly, truly remarkable. The, the level of, you could say sometimes ruthlessness, <laughs> the, the level of like tactical thinking, strategic uh, reorganizations, um, where, where some millions suddenly get unlocked to pour into automation of a very specific process that then generates incredible upside in terms of RevOps. Um, that is, is, it's really something to, to be on top of. And again, this program is meant to, to provide support and knowledge and experience to leaders, not followers. Brilliant. Lovely. And what a great way to finish. And I think just to build on what um, Pat said earlier on about those heavy processes and getting rid of those heavy processes or looking to more, what do you call them, light processes, or uh, I can't remember uh, what, what exactly you said, Pat, but, uh, but whatever it was, uh, the, the, the words you used, I think was a really good example of that agility that's needed. Um, uh, just a, a point here uh, from Sonia, excellent presentation, very informed formative I can see as an H, uh, as an as an HR professional that this is a program exception <coughs> a program it's exceptionally uh, especially the approach to understanding it's a brilliant option to develop marketeers in our business okay thank you for that Sonia guys listen thank you so much I think we've uh, we've ran a little bit over but uh, I think it was well worth it um, and Pat look uh, uh, as always uh, you know uh, I think uh, we could have easily listened to you for, for for a couple of hours and you could have talked to to some of your experiences but be at Walmart you know eBay uh, the governments etc cetera, etc cetera. but I think uh, I think um, uh, anybody who participates will get a real insight into what's required to, to, to really transform an organization and bring that agility, not just to their own personal lives, but also to the way they lead businesses and, uh, and lead teams. So, so thank you very much for your time. And Frederick uh, also as well. I think uh, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions uh, uh, building on this. But guys, thank you all um, for, for listening. Um, as I said, if there's any uh, questions or anything following up, please make, feel free to contact myself or Jenny, and we'd be happy to uh, either uh, put any questions to either Pat or Frederick or anybody else uh, in relation to the programme. Well, thank you very much, Pat. Pleasure. And Frederick, yeah, thanks a million. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.